Hi, it's Polly and Mr. Snoots, who is a wise and kind beast, which is something we could all do with these days. Yeah, love it. Anyway, look, tea talk. Um, so, look, we've had some stuff coming in about uh, how do I run an inclusive games group, games table? And I've seen a lot of that going back and forth. However, with some of the right wing crap going on over in the USA right now, there's also a lot of hopelessness and so on. So right at this moment, this kind of thing is more important than it's ever been. Because role playing is a very important place for the queer community. Um, you get a lot of people who will be running characters of genders other than the one they're presenting as, because they're basically trying that skin on. How does it feel? This is them tentatively doing gender exploration. It will be part of a lot of people's coming out journey. It was a huge part of mine. Um, it's very important, but the games groups are a sheltered sort of place for sharing stories and for feeling free. So that establishment of these places as inclusive spaces is important. And I think an overlooked thing is miniatures clubs. For me, again, let's make it all about me. All right, let's make it about us. Our personal journey, one, one's personal journey. Um, when I was a teenager and I, like, and I mean 12, and I walked into a mini, historical miniatures war games club and I was just accepted as one of the adults. Clearly you're here because you know history, you're interested. They just immediately hear. Um, we're doing Napoleonics. Okay, well, how much do you know about Napoleonics? Uh, all right, um, this is the French. You're playing the French side. You can sub-general this side. Muskets work like this. Carry works like that. Artillery works like that. It's more dangerous in this range because they fire a canister, which makes them like, a, yeah, you know that. Good, fantastic. Go. And suddenly you've got this amazing confidence because you're not just like a kid with no opinions worth listening to or anything. You're in this sheltered space where you're valued. You're kind of one of the gang your skills and your knowledge is valued. You know, that's a huge part of someone's personal journey. So these are vital spaces. So we'll take a little side skip. Let me briefly describe to you what it's like being part of the most hated minority on the planet's surface. It's not elephants, it's trans people. And uh, I know and love a lot of um, trans masculine people, that is who've gone from female gender to male, they don't, they catch their own crap, and I will not speak for them. I know trans women, that's people who've gone from male gender to female gender in their presentation. We were always that gender, but we catch a lot of um, crap from, you know, the patriarchy and the, um, you know, the bigot boys because we terrify them. Because if we could change, then they could secretly be female too. Plus, we, we basically just threaten the entire structure of the patriarchy. For some reason, it just throws their gears into a spin. I wish they had one neck. But anyway, um, this stuff that's going on at the moment over in the USA, it is a nightmare. big part of my degree, my honours degree, in fact, was in um, the spread of authoritarianism and fascism in the early 20th century. So this is amazing, watching what's happening in the States. It's textbook. And as each move has happened, it's like, well, yes, yeah. Sorry, and none of you are going to move. And none of you are going to do anything. It's a very, it's an oddly passive country. Extremely passive country. Um, anyway. But there's a lot of queer people who are sort of terrified right now. So just to, again, to fill you in on sort of what it's like to be this... The first thing I have to do every morning is clear the hate comments off this channel. Um, those can just run from just the usual snarky barbs. You will never be a real woman, blah, 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 blah. Says, Darling, I've been more of a man than you'll ever be. And I'm more of a woman than you'll ever have. So, mm, from me and mm, from Mr. Snoots. But I also get a lot about now death threats. Um, those death threats, by the way, are immediately forwarded on to both the Australian and Interpol police forces. So congratulations, you've all got files opened on you. <sighs> Say hello to your local FBI. Um, keyboard cowards, of course. Um, they don't want to meet me face to face because, you know, that's 
pretty good way to get a trip to the morgue, and, to be brutally honest. But um, my social media, like Facebook, is all locked because if I leave it open, like if someone says, oh, could you make this comment shareable? If I do that, I have family who are waiting to pounce and they will fill my entire, say, Facebook feed with filth. They'll post hundreds of pre-done comments that they've got ready to do. and They'll post out-and-out -out porn. They'll literally post trans porn and everything all over my site as answers to every comment that anyone's ever put on any of my social media. They'll flood hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. And I'll do it within minutes. <sighs> Becoming trans, you will lose every friend that you ever had, basically. You'll lose all your family. Your children will walk. All gone. Um, it's not done lightly. This isn't something we do for shits and giggles. But that level of constant attack... Now, I live in Perth, Australia. Australia, the most peaceful, peaceful, peaceful place on earth. I can't begin to explain to friends in America what a raging hellhole you live in. An absolute hellhole. Just the daily violence and so on that just seems to be backbeat there. So it's, it's not a factor here. I raised children, you know, up into their mid-twenties, and it was never a thought in my head that they might get shot. They can't get shot. It just can't happen. I walk streets at night, wherever. I can't get shot. I have been attacked here, however. But only since becoming trans. There's something about being trans which seems to make people feel they can just shower death threats and absolute filth over you, which they would never do to any other group. They would never do this. They, literally, it's not in your experience unless you've been a trans woman. You just, you can't understand what it's like. It's not like being an African-American in the 60s. You know, it's like, that's a different experience where, you know, like the old South there being forced off the street walk, you know, um, segregation, different. So that's a different sort of thing. But in this case, it's just like a general feeling that making public death threats against the trans people is just acceptable. You can just do it. And so that's what's in our minds when we see someone say, um, oh, I run an open table. Everyone's welcome at my games table. What's in our heads is, really, where's the attack going to come from? Because it'll come from somewhere. We're not looking for violence. We're not looking for offence. But we know it's out there. It's lurking and it'll come from the strangest places. So that's why we're wary. And that's why when someone sort of says, oh, you know, oh uh, everyone's welcome at my table. It's like, you won't be met with a lot of... Yeah, that sounds great from trans people. We are suspicious. Deeply, powerfully suspicious. Because we know what lurks. I've been to a lot of groups where we sit there and then someone inevitably comes around with, oh, you yeah, know, because I'm a real trans ally, but bigotry is like a hornet, okay? The sting is in the butt. I'm a real trans ally, but I just don't think trans women should be allowed to um, compete with women in sport. Really, you're an expert on women's sports now, are we? Oh, I'm, no, I'm, I really support trans people, but I just don't think drag queens should be reading... Um, Reading children's stories to children in, in public libraries. What, like they have for like 50 years? Fine. If they've got that butt, they are a bigot. And the thing about bigots is they would do you whatever harm it is their capability to do if they thought they could get away with it. You're not gently a bigot. You're not casually a bigot. A, a bigot would kill you if they could. So that's why we have to keep so alert because our personal safety and the safety of those that we love and care for is what's being gambled here. So how do you make a group inclusive? Well, sadly, the first thing is policing yourselves. There is a background kind of locker room joke 
locker room comment culture, which has to go. I've been in some groups and they're well-meaning groups here. But, you know, there's guys making comments about girls' asses and you know, how hot the girl was who was like, you know, here last week and so on. And it's, it's like, she's there. What? She's at the next table. She can hear you. It's like, and she's probably not going to come back. And that's what chased women away back in the good old days. Went, oh, yeah, we always had women in our group. Did you? Did they stay? Where are they now? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, they just faded one day. They faded because they'd had enough of you. And we lost those voices for decades. They're back now because young people are coming in and they've left most of these bigotries behind. But they've also learned how to deal with other genders as if they're human beings and not just sex objects. So that's why you get these really buoyant, kind of very vibrant um groups playing these games why there's such a young culture coming into role playing games because that that safe space they've discovered it for themselves and they've discovered it despite the vicious old bastards in osr which is what drives the osr people crazy no one needed your great wisdom no one needed your guidance these guys found the thing that we found for ourselves and they found it for themselves and they made it theirs but we we could all be one community if only these people would leave it alone. But it does mean policing yourself. That culture has to go. But funnily enough, like the thing about making a games group a table truly inclusive is that everyone has to be included quietly, without struggle, automatically. They just have to be known. You know, you just have to let it known that you are completely welcome. That means your stories are welcome that the sort of stories you're going to tell with characters and role-playing games are welcome. People are going to want to run queer characters. They're going to want to do trans romances. They're going to want to play with gender roles. They're going to want to try swapping gender roles between player and character. They're going to want to do all these things. They want to go on to play different species. Sometimes they want to play the species or the, the lineage or whatever that is somewhat othered because, you know, they're telling you about their experience. Or they're trying to play, play out how they want to fight the man. You know, these are all important things that need to be welcome. But that culture of sort of telling strange jokes or just making people feel uncomfortable, that, that kind of has to be... That has to be ended. And it's just like anything. There's a social contract that comes with gaming. It's a social experience, and there's a social contract that goes with any group as to what is and isn't acceptable, what isn't and isn't comfortable. You just have to be aware that the social contract is going to have to change a bit to make those people that you want to bring in truly comfortable. And a big part of that is you can't have someone, see, we even accept freaks like you. This is punch. Um, so it's just quiet acceptance. At this time, with the stuff that's going on in the USA, this is more important than ever. There are a lot of young kids who will be in a panic because, basically, their lives are at stake. There are people wandering the streets saying they just want to kill these people. So these kids, they need a safe place. If you're an older trans person, it's our job to take the hits. It's our job to protect the baby trans. That's what we're for. Um... So we can't be afraid. We have to be there fighting. But particularly for the younger players, they need to know that there's safe spaces to go and safe spaces to be. So it's very important to start thinking about how to run these truly inclusive spaces. And that means not just inclusive for trans people. That means inclusive for disabled people. That means... Be inclusive for people from different races, different religions, different social backgrounds, different different countries, different accents, all of it. Bring them in as part of the gang. Now, role-playing games have done a really, really good job of actually starting to work these changes. Those young players coming in have really given it a shot in the arm. And that culture is filtering down from like that youthful top down through gaming. And I'm really enjoying seeing it happen. Um, a place where this isn't happening is miniatures gaming. Historical miniatures gaming, but also, say, the Warhammer 40k community is infamous for its Nazi values and its misogyny. Historical miniatures gaming is, is a ragingly misogynist environment, which is weird when you see how some of its founders were these wonderful women like um, Sue Barker and so on, who were 
such foundation designers. But but there seems to be a, basically a, a feel that it's it's the province of kind of middle aged to elderly bigoted old white guys. So it, it hasn't brought in that rush of young players. Um, and I think part of it is kind of almost the, the fault of we designers. There hasn't been a lot of work done on trying to make historical miniatures attractive to a younger audience. We've been working on trying to make better and better games for you know that discerning audience. But we kind of need to start doing games that communicate the excitement. When you opened an old Donald Featherston book or an old Charles Grant book that was written in the 60s or 70s that would be about Napoleonics or skirmish gaming or, you know, tank battles and miniatures or whatever, you could feel the excitement of the author about how much they loved this and it it communicated across to you so easily. Yes, I want to do this. This is fantastic. You were, you were a fan by the time you'd gotten half a dozen pages in. You wanted to do this too. They communicated the love. I think more work has to be done in miniature gaming to take it away from a bunch of old guys drowning at a table. Yes, this moves. It's got factor five and it's moving three inches. Oh, sorry, you've moved 3.1. Oh, <laughs> um, it has to move away from that and be something that communicates more fun and more love of the colour and the period and the excitement and try and bring that love before a younger audience to draw them in. So, yeah, I'd like to find some publishers to work with on that. I, I think I can see how it will be done, but it's something that hasn't been done. The best you'll find is like Warlords, Miniatures and so on who try and make like dirt simple rules, but they're always like attached to massive, massive, massive miniatures ranges that'll cost you, you know, 2,000 bucks to set up an army, which, you know, the younger audience doesn't have. So something designed, you know, for lower budget, high excitement, high interest. We're talking historical. We're not talking, you know, Frostgrave here. You know, there needs to be something. So, all right. So, miniatures is a part of the hobby that needs more work. It's going to die out. Those clubs are aging out. They really are. There's not. There's no new blood coming in. Role playing, role playing. Look, I think we're doing fine. There is a core of really unpleasant bastards. The neat thing is that we're all aware of them, and um, we work to basically make sure that their voices aren't the ones that people hear when they think role playing games. Um, which means more people come in, more safe spaces for the people who need it, particularly right now. <sighs> For those of you who are in the United States, Australia, we don't get you. We vote. It's, they say it's compulsory. It isn't. We're cheap bastards. If we don't vote, we get fined about 10 bucks because that's how they fund the vote. But I'm, a, I'm an election polling place volunteer. Um, I volunteer to man the polling places. I count votes. I, um, I handle people who come in for one thing. Um, it's as our ambassador for the trans community, every single person in the district gets to meet a trans person as part of this process and just see how damn nice we are. Um, so it's a great way of doing it, but also it helps the process run. I'm going to be oddly Australian here. Um, we got that digger mentality where you just everything's for the community. You just do stuff for the community. I would like, I would like some Americans to get that please. Instead of staying at home and banging on the keyboard and saying that we're doomed and that everything's over or whatever, or praying a useless activity, check it out. It's never harmed or, well, actually it's harmed to lots of people. It's never helped anyone. Do something, do something. Get out there and make sure the process works. See what you can do to help elections run. See what you can do to get the word out about candidates. S make sure that everyone understands the absolute viciousness of the American Republican Party at the moment, Project 2025 and its clone, Agenda 47. Um, make sure that people know. Make sure that they're aware. But that means get up away from the keyboard and start doing something. Physically attend protests. Yes, I know you're in danger. Do it. Explain to your grandfather or for younger people, great-grandfathers, 
who you know went out there fighting Nazis in World War II, how you would have done it, but it was just too comfortable to sit at home and play on the keyboard rather than actually do some work to stop it. Stop it. You get the world that you work for. If you don't work for a better world, you won't get one. <sighs> because evil never sleeps. And that's the thing. We're role-playing gamers. This is what we do. Fighting evil is what we do. So do it. Figuratively speaking, <sighs> buckle on the plate armor, get the longsword, the shield, the six torches and flask of oil, and get out there. See what you can do to make the world better. Part of that is making safe spaces for those who feel really really set on and in danger at the moment. So do that too. Make sure that's a priority. Make sure that you run game spaces that everyone can enjoy and that welcome in people, particularly people who at the moment feel very much in danger. So anyway, look, that's just some thoughts from a very small elephant and myself. We shall see you around the games table. Look after yourselves. Be amazing ambassadors for gaming. Love the games. Bye. You want to turn it off. All right, I'll see how that works.